Yeah, it was a very rambly video. Yeah. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Felipe. And I'm Lillian. And we are the Postmodern Family. We are Americans living in the UK reacting to Great Britain. We make five new videos a week, so hit that subscribe button now. In this episode, we're going to react to Simon Roper. Uh, Lillian has never watched any Simon Roper. I watched him while she was away. Okay. And it's just a young chap archaeologist who talks about uh, philology and uh, languages. And he's going to talk about what is the oldest English dialect. So this is a young guy. Um, he does a lot of, he reenacts what an Anglo-Saxon accent might have looked like. He just as a hobby studies languages, English, the English language. Mm. And um, it's really interesting, really cool guy. So let's, uh, I know you're interested in languages, so. Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, sorry about my busyness, which has caused a slightly later than normal video. But today we're going to be talking about the idea of an oldest dialect, and by extension, the idea of an oldest language. And I think this is kind of a point of pride for a lot of people, because we like the idea that some aspect of our culture is unique. And one way for it to be unique is for it to be very old. So we like the idea that we are living um, or doing things in a way which is more kind of original than the way that other people are doing it. And Jackson Crawford's made a fantastic video about the concept of original, um, the concept of an original language or you know an original piece of literature, which I'll link in the description. Um, and I think this is understandable. You know, I like the idea that certain things I do and certain aspects of the way I speak are conservative, and I seek out those aspects and I kind of analyse them. Um, which is a difficulty in linguistics because people who are interested in these things might almost preferentially use more conservative features because they find them more interesting. But in terms of the way the average person who is not interested in linguistics speaks, yeah, there's this big interest in what is the oldest dialect, what's the dialect that is conserved most from older stages of English. One oldest dialect claim that I've heard a lot and also heard counted a lot is the comparison between uh, British and American English whereby people get the impression that um, American English is more phonologically conservative and that if you went back to southeastern England in, in the sort of 16 or 1700s then you'd hear a load of American accents and this is a very good illustration of some of the issues that there are in trying to wheedle this stuff out so I've said before that American dialects are more likely to be rhotic and have r pronounced in all positions in a word whereas British English dialects are more likely to drop r where a vowel doesn't come immediately afterwards so an American would say car where a British speaker might say car but on the other hand British English dialects are more likely to have t between two vowels whereas many US dialects turn that into an alveolar tap so a word that was probably butter in 1700 has ended up more like butter in the US and butter in the UK so you can see what I mean both the dialects we're comparing have preserved different things and also innovated different things. And the same is true of something like Geordie, which is often held up as a conservative dialect. So it preserves the monophthongal vowel in words like mouth from Middle English and Old English, so mouth. And in that way, it's very conservative. But it also has really innovative diphthongs that have clearly appeared since the Middle English period. So think about the ur and ear in alun and niem. These are not features of Old English. These are things that are uh, specific to kind say? of Scottish Alone? border and very far mm. northern English dialects. And Near? they've become more Near? relegated to very far northern English dialects over the last um, probably 100 mm -hmm. years or so. Another way that you might count the conservativeness of a dialect is by what distinctions it preserves. So I have American friends in their 20s and 30s who have a three-way distinction between the words court, cart and coat. Um, and apologies if my American accent is not um, perfectly up to scratch there. But the point is that these three words all sound different to each other. Whereas when you listen to an older Cumbrian relative of mine, sort of in his mid-80s, say these words, they come across sounding pretty much identical. Cart, cart, cart. <laughs> and when I ask him, is there a difference between this word and this word when you say them, he says, no, they sound the same to me. 
And this is because in Cumbrian there have been various vowel mergers. Um, even in older speakers, there's been a disappearance of the r phoneme when it comes before a consonant, which has led to these words just merging and becoming homophones with each other. In reality, I think this word is becoming homophonous with these other two words for most older Cumbrian speakers uh, from, from that area. Uh, but they may still perceive a distinction right. because there's an old way of pronouncing this word in Cumbrian, which is cult or cult, mm. um, and they might be sort of remembering that kind of distinction. But the point is that the, the younger American speakers preserve more old distinctions than the older Cumbrian speakers in this instance. So although you might think of the Cumbrian, you know, an older Cumbrian speaker as being, um, you know, an example of somebody that speaks a really conservative dialect, they actually have a lot of distinctions collapsed, uh, where speakers of, you know, younger speakers of different dialects might have those uh, distinctions preserved. Among the accents that I've described, the American one is the most conservative in terms of distinctions, but the actual sounds they use to produce these words aren't the same sounds as a Middle English speaker would use. So in textbook Middle English, there'd be something like caught, caught, court. But that's a very linguisty way of thinking about conservativity. Probably to most people, the idea of an oldest dialect is framed more sort of impressionistically. So for example, if you heard older English spoken, what modern dialect would it remind you of most? Or which modern dialect has speakers that would best understand older stages of English? And even those two questions will have many different answers. So in my video showing a London accent through the ages, at one point in the Middle English portion of the video, the character remarked that a man had moths in his heed. And a few comments said that this reminded them of the way Scottish people might say heed to mean the head. Um, in other words, the sentence impressionistically resembled Scottish English or Scots. But in Southeastern Middle English, the head was called the head, and the heed gives us the modern word hide, as in skin. What the man is talking about in that recording, or what I am talking about in that recording, is the skin, not the head. So even though it resembled Scottish English, a Scottish speaker might actually not have understood it as it was meant. And I think these little details are sometimes the most interesting things. So rather than looking for some sort of monolithic oldest dialect, I think it's more interesting to look at the ways that different dialects have innovated new things. Because sound changes are happening now just as they were 500 years ago, and this is history playing out. You know, sort of by any metric, the dialects we speak now will be ancient by the standards of people a thousand years in the future. And here we are speaking them natively. Um, and I think that's a really interesting thing to experience, you know, the, the history of sound change playing out in front of you. Sometimes people will look at something that's unusual about a dialect and maybe assume that because it's unique, it must be conservative. So I've seen this done with certain features of West Midlands dialects, like what you might find in Birmingham, um, and also more rural dialects from the black country. So interesting innovations like the O oh diphthong that you find in words like yo, um, sorry if I'm not pronouncing that very well, and features of syntax like, um, so until a few decades ago, people in the black country used housen as the plural of house. One house, many housen. And this sounds like the kind of thing that should be a conservative preserved feature from Old or Middle English, but the reality is a bit more complicated. Old English had lots of ways of marking plurals, of telling you that there's more than one of something. And one of these evolved into the standard English S plural marker that we see in words like pianos, trees, foxes. Another one of those evolved into the UN plural marker that we find at the end of oxen. Mm -hmm. In textbook Old English, the word house didn't take either of those plural markers. The nominative plural of hus was just hus. <laughs> one hus, many hus. The closest thing to either of these modern forms was husis, but that was the genitive singular. Se rof thas husis, the roof of the house. So the black country dialect did preserve an old plural marker, but generalised it to words that didn't originally have it. And standard English has done the same thing, just with a different plural marker. I definitely find the black country example more interesting, but that's just because it's different to the English I'm used to. It's not that it's a perfect continuation of an older version of English, but it's conservative and innovative in different ways to standard English. Another factor that complicates things a little bit is that rural and non-standard dialects are by their very nature going to seem to be more conservative by standard English 
because standard English is treated as a standard. Most people who speak regional dialect of English are bi-dialectal and are capable of speaking standard English as well as their own dialect and they hear it constantly on the television, on the radio and from people around them. But a native speaker of standard English isn't necessarily capable of speaking or even sort of completely understanding a given regional dialect. So if standard English and Devonian English, for example, both have the same concentration of old features and innov innovated features, the Devonian speaker is going to have access to a wider range of old features because she can speak and understand standard English as well as the Devonian dialect. Whereas the standard English speaker might look at the way the Devonian speaks and think the conservative features are really surprising and weird because he's not used to them. And it's easy to fall into this kind of trap when we think about other languages as well. So when we look for an oldest language or a most conservative language. If we don't look too far into the way languages diversify, we might be more naturally inclined to ask which language that I know did all the other languages come from? Was it Latin or was it Hebrew or was it Sanskrit? Um, did all the Germanic languages come from German? Are all the Balto-Slavic languages just dialects of Lithuanian? Um, you know, some people have religious reasons for believing that all languages came from a specific holy language, and I'm not going to argue with that because that's none, none of my business. Um, but to take the Germanic language as an example, it doesn't really make sense at this point to ask which is the most conservative Germanic language, because the existing Germanic languages have been separate for well over a thousand years, probably closer to two thousand. And all of them have accumulated 2,000 years' worth of sound changes and grammatical changes. Imagine a woman has children. Those children give her grandchildren, and those grandchildren give her great-grandchildren. If you ask which one of those great-grandchildren looks the most like the original woman, there's probably not going to be a straightforward answer. And in fact, I'd say it's more likely that none of them look all that much like her. Um, and that's not a perfect analogy, because languages don't reproduce sexually, and there's no partnership involved. <laughs> But the point stands that after a certain amount of time, picking which language has conserved the most features is a bit tricky. So Icelandic has preserved the most inflectional morphology structures, but none of that morphology sounds the same as it did in Proto-Germanic, so you'd only be able to tell if you did a thorough analysis of it or knew both languages. German has preserved a lot of the case system, but it's undergone a massive consonant shift, and I know a few people within the linguistics community who sort of semi-jokingly say that the German case system is a few decades away from collapsing. English has lost most of the inflectional morphology, but it's preserved certain phonemes like th and w, which have disappeared in German. So which one of these languages is the most conservative? You could go at this from the impressionistic angle. So if I said the sentence, Gattus Faubilin Husa, which language do you think that most resembles? I can't really tell what I think. Um, if, if I heard it in the street, I might not even guess that it was a Germanic language. So I can't tell which modern one I think it sounds the most like. But this mentality can also lead to us asking questions about our own language, which are maybe a bit misled. Um, so speaking as an English speaker, it's easy to look at features of English and ask, which other language did this feature come from? Did it come from French or Welsh, or did we borrow it from Old Norse? Whereas in reality, the answer to most of these questions will just be, well, it's just English. There's an unbroken line from English to Old English to Proto-Germanic to Proto-Indo-European, and most features of English are continuations of features that have always been there. The interesting question is often not where does it come from, but what does it come from? What historical thing has changed to give us what we have now? Thank you very much for listening to this more uh, rambly video, and I hope uh, that whatever comes next will interest you and that this has interested you as well. And thank you very much indeed to everybody who has donated on Patreon. I appreciate uh, these things very much, particularly as you don't really get anything back from it. Um, but I, I'm very grateful that people have been so kind as to contribute. Yeah. I think that's everything so, in my, my notes. Okay. What did you think? Yeah, it was a very rambly video. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he didn't really answer the question, and I think that annoys me. <laughs> <laughs> so, is his answer basically, no one knows? I think so. And stop trying to guess. I think so. <laughs> You'll never find out. I didn't know until he, I watched the previous video, and he reaffirmed it here, that English was at some stage an inflected language. Mm-hmm.
Did yeah. you know that? That's it. Yeah, he said. I noticed that he said that. I didn't. Know but did that. you know that before? Yeah. Wow. That's interesting because. Yeah. Not very many languages are inflected now. Mandarin is Just, not inflected. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yeah. You don't conjugate. You don't add endings. Inflected, I thought, means by tone. No. Gr well, it might mean that as well. Oh. Grammatically, inflected means it's, you've got conjugations. I thought that meant declined. Declined. I thought that was some, a different Oh. Word. Well, let's look it up. I thought... I thought inflected meant tonal, a tonal language. No, then all languages are inflected, aren't they? No, there's no difference between you saying horse and horse and horse. It's all the same. But in Chinese, if you said ma versus uh -oh, ma okay, okay, hang on. and ma, they're, they're different things based on the tone. Yeah. Inflected language meaning okay word formation Whoops. where the word is modified see and you get oh see so yeah like latin that's it okay so let's hmm. see in which a word is modified to express different grammatical categories. Mm -hmm. The inflection of verbs is called conjugation. Mm -hmm. okay. And one may refer to inflected nouns oh, okay. as a declension. So then maybe yeah. English was never what I thought was a tonal language. I thought that was really interesting <laughs> that it could have been a tonal language and now we've lost the tones, but no, no, no. that's not what he was saying. No. Okay, yeah. It means it was like Latin. It makes sense, yeah. Yeah. We do have conjugations. They're just not consistent. And... They're, yeah, they're, um, the paradigms are not yeah. universal. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and then I didn't know that the, uh, the plural case had different, Plural. Different endings. Mm -hmm. uh, the That's where our exceptions come from. Yeah. 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 But it was interesting to, to hear that. So yeah, there are some dialects that preserve some features and that innovate in others. And that all the dialects seem to be do innovating. Both. Yeah, they do. Yeah, and they do do both. They preserve and they innovate. But one of the things that Chinese people like to say all the time is that their culture and language is the oldest. Mm-hmm. So how do we... But there is ancient Chinese, which mm. looks different than modern mm. written and No spoken. one speaks it then. I don't know. Mm. I think the spoken part might be more preserved. They probably mm. just would have had different words. I mean, they, they have to continue inventing words, obviously, mm. like telephone and things like that. Yeah. Um, mm. And then other ones would go out of fashion. You would never say them. Yeah. But... Okay. What'd you think of the shot of the house and the zooming in, the like focusing? At least it, it adds some variation to just looking at him. Yeah, it was odd. I thought when he first had the shot of blackberries, I thought he was going to talk about the word blackberries, blackberries, <laughs> you know how... Because you're a very visual learner. Yeah, but then <laughs> he didn't talk about it, and I realized he was just using it as a filler. Filler, yeah. It's weird. It doesn't match with he, what he's saying or yeah. anything. Yeah, doesn't do anything for it. Kind you. of makes my mind wander, like, oh, mm. look at that piece of wood. It's got spider webs Maybe on it. Maybe he's creating art thanks so much for watching this episode we hope you enjoyed it leave your own particular english dialect in the comments thanks thanks bye bye